If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. If you did not bring your Bible, we're going to put all the verses on the screen so that you can follow along and make sure I'm not making stuff up here. Matthew chapter 4, verse number 18. It reads, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. For those of you taking notes online or on the balcony, on the floor, those of you taking notes, you can jot this down. This is the title of today's message, The Ultimate Sleeper Hunter. The Ultimate Sleeper Hunter. I, um, I don't know much about these NFT things, okay? Do y'all know about these? I, I'm, I'm hearing about them. I guess it's digital artwork, and you can, I mean, they're going for a lot of money, some of them. I guess the market on NFTs might be a little bit down right now from what I've heard, but, but there's like these digital pieces of art that someone can create, and it can just go on and blow up and cost a, cost a, a fortune to ever purchase one. But before we ever making NFTs like we are today, uh, our, and I guess it still happens today, obviously, is made on canvases. People would paint and, and draw. Uh, and some of you, you know, you're wannabe artists. You know, you got something up in your house, and it's pretty to you, but it's ugly to everybody else. <laughs> Parents, we all know this. Our kids have brought us terrible pieces of artwork, and we have to lie to them time and time and time again. This is the best piece of art I've ever seen in my entire life. And, and, and that's cool. Uh, but, but there are pieces of art uh, that are in uh, art houses that are called sleepers. And these sleepers, and I have the definition for you uh, on the screen. These sleepers are, are misattributed uh, pieces of art. They, they, they've given some value because of the oversight of some expert. Somebody looked at it and, and they, they ended up pricing that piece of artwork beneath what it's actually worth. These are our sleepers. A, a sleeper hunter then is someone that goes to these art houses and they are looking for these pieces of art that some expert put a value on but the sleeper hunter knows is worth way, way more than the price tag that is on it. Uh, so they, they walk into an art house, and whether they're in some basement somewhere or they're somewhere in a lobby and they're panning through, scrolling through different pieces of art, and as they, as they stumble on something, they can tell if this art house knew who made you. If this art house knew who painted you if this art house knew who created you there is no way in the world you would be able to be valued at what you're valued no one would be able to purchase you for this price because someone misdiagnosed did not perceive correctly what you are actually worth can I submit to you that Jesus is the ultimate sleeper hunter. That Jesus, even today, is walking through homes, bedrooms. He's walking in lobbies and in balconies. He's walking up and down aisles. And he's saying, if they knew who made you, they would not be able to devalue you the way they're devaluing you. If they knew who created you, they would not be able to look at you and just walk past you. Dare I say that Jesus even walks into rehab centers and divorce courts. He walks into high schools and junior high schools. He walks into magnet schools. He walks into colleges. He walks into businesses. He walks into neighborhoods. And he's looking at people saying, I know a great piece of art when I see it. I know what you're worth. I know what you're valued because I know who made you. It was me. Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 and 15. 
Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. It, this is a, a great passage of scripture, even to memorize uh, one day. But it says the son is the image. Jesus is the image. He's the picture of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. The son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. How many things were created in him? All things. All things. Not some things. All things. So that includes me and you. That includes men and women. That includes black people, white people, Latino people, Asian people, tall people, short people. That includes, includes people with long hair, no hair. That includes those that have a two-parent home and those who might be in a single-parent home. That includes people who have a whole bunch of money in the bank. And that includes people who are broke right now. That includes those who are living in their car and those who are living in a penthouse. That includes everybody. I don't care where you're from. If you're homeless, he made you. If you're a CEO, he made you. If you got a PhD, he he made you if you have your GED he made you what he's saying here is it does not matter where you're from or what you look like you did not get here unless Jesus decided for you to be here in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities all things have been created through him and for him all things were created through Jesus and for Jesus we get messed up on this because we think the for of our life is for our fame and our own glory and our bank accounts and our happiness but really the for of our life is Jesus we were made through Jesus and for Jesus. We are a, we're a basketball family, okay? And um, yesterday, something fantastic happened. Um, my daughter, uh, our daughter Elle, seven years old, grabbed a basketball and started dribbling. And I looked at her, and I'm like, this is my ticket. I, I, I mean, I, 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 love, I love my boys, but, but, but I'm looking at Elle, and I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm riding this all the way to the NBA, WNBA. She, she, she's got it. She's got it. She's got it. She's going right hand. And I'm like, Elle, show me your left hand. Show me your left hand. She starts dribbling with the left. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Now run, Elle. Run there with the right hand and run back. And I'm looking at I'm like, okay. Oh, my God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I'm thankful for what, what God did with my, my oldest son, Parker. He's wonderful. I'm thankful what he did with Grayson. He's fantastic too. But man, I think he put some special on my daughter here. Her basketball, it's too late for Parker. It's too late for Grayson. 17, 12, their time has passed. But seven, I can work with seven years old. And here, I had her even this morning before church. I'm like, okay, show me that right hand again. And she's smiling. She's doing it right hand, smiling, smiling left hand. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is exciting. So, so we, we love basketball. Um, and we wanted to, we wanted to surprise uh, our oldest son, uh, Parker, uh, with a gift. And a, a number of years ago, uh, we got connected uh, with, a, with a friend of ours who was uh, an assistant coach for the Dallas Mavericks. And, uh, and he and his family were coming to the church uh, for a while. And just, just great, great people, wonderful people. And uh, I remember I had his number because uh, now he's actually the coach of the Orlando Magic. Uh, his name is Jamal Mosley. And I texted him. I said, hey, um, do you happen to have like a real NBA basketball that I can have, like a real one. And he texted me back, he's like, I got you. And I'm like, what? I said, okay, uh, hey, how much? You know, I wanna pay for this, because I'm not asking for free stuff, y'all, okay? Some of y'all, you're always asking for free stuff. So, I'm trying to use your position to get free stuff, don't do that, all right? So I'm like, hey, can I pay, can I pay for it? And uh, he's like, no, you can't pay for it. I'm like, come on, let me pay for it. You, you gotta do some back and forth here, okay? They need to know you're serious. If all of your friends you go out to eat with and they never fight over the check, 
you better get some new friends, okay? <laughs> I got it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Like, no, I didn't really want to get it. I wanted you to fight me for it because I actually don't have it. <laughs> anyway, I say, you know, thank you so much. And this random box shows up. Where's my man, Elvin? I'll toss you that, Elvin. I, I can catch it. Thank you, sir. Okay. He sends me. We, we open the box. Parker's there, me and Onika are there. And Parker opens the box up. And this ball is sitting in there. It's all worn. It's been like used by like real NBA basketball players. I'm like, Park, our eyes are like, oh my gosh, oh my, we don't know if it was in a game, if it was just in practice, we don't care. It was real, real NBA players. We, we put, we put our, couple of our initials, the beginning of MCC on this, because if you take it someplace, I play with some ghetto dudes sometimes, they might try to, Take it. Oh, I didn't know it was your ball, man. Oh, really? 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 This is not a target. This is not a target basketball, okay? You know, you're like, oh, official NBA. No, no, that's not official. This right here is official official. Has been in the hands of NBA players. You don't take this ball out and play outside on concrete. This is an indoor only basketball. You don't leave this sitting in the driveway. This is indoor only because it has NBA players' hands all over it. Can I also submit to you, Elvin? I'm trusting you. Okay, thank you, sir. He played uh, professional baseball, so he, he's good. I knew he was going to catch that. Uh, can I submit to you that your life is a life? since you were made through Jesus and for Jesus, where his hands are all over you, can I submit to you that you actually have been touched by the creator of all things? Can I just let you know that you're not just some random piece of artwork that just happened to show up, but Jesus decided and designed the God of the universe designed for you to be in this world. There is no one that's in an art gallery this morning looking at a piece of art, thinking that piece of art made itself. They're admiring the art. They are, they're fascinated. They're trying to get to the, the, the deeper level of the art. They're trying to get into the mind of the artist. Why did you stroke the paint that way? And I just need you to know that there was an artist up in heaven that was knitting you together and put you together. And he doesn't do things on accident. And his handprints are all over your life. So I... I was thinking about this, though, and the, 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 the worth and value that we must have because Jesus made us. And I, I got a little, just a little commercial break for us here. And, and the commercial break is this. Just because uh, someone acknowledges your worth doesn't mean they're worth your time. Just because they acknowledge your worth does not mean they are worth your time. Just because they DM you does not mean they're worth your time. Just because they ask you out does not mean they are worth your time. I was uh, growing up and I was on my way. Some of y'all, most of y'all will not know about this. This is the penny candy store that we had in our neighborhood. The penny candy store is a store and everything cost a... See, y'all got it. So if you have 10 cents, you can get 10 pieces of candy. I mean, you can go get a now and later. You can go get a Sour Patch Kid. You can go ahead. I mean, you can get Swedish Fish. You, you can go to the store. If you got a dollar, a hundred pieces of candy. Some of y'all are doing the math. You're like, wait, a hundred? Yeah. A dollar's a hundred pennies, okay? So we, we're on our way to the Penny Candy Store, and my mom, I love her so much, I don't know what she did, but she bought me a pair of lime green corduroy pants. And I'm wearing them, okay? And these corduroys are loud. I'm just a... 
My thighs are hot. I just want to go get some penny candy. My, my thighs are burning up. I'm just walking with my friends, and we're talking loud because they can't hear over my pants. And we, <laughs> we're headed to the penny candy store, and, and there's this dude across the street, and he opens up his car door. Now, uh, I grew up in the inner city, and I don't want, don't you do this, don't you profile anybody, but I knew that's a drug dealer. He knew it. I've been around enough to know that's a drug dealer. So he opens his door and he says, yo, yeah, you, come here. And he's pointing at me. I think the lime green pants kind of made me stand out from everybody. <laughs> so he points at me, he says, hey, hey, you, come here. And I'm like, well, what do I do here? This is, this is a drug deal. I, I, I got to go. So I'm with, I'm with like five or seven of us. I'm like 13 years old. I start walking towards him. I'm in the middle of the street, you know. I'm walking, I'm walking towards him. And my friends start going, Earl, Earl, Earl. I don't know at, w at what point their voices got so loud that it stopped me in my tracks. And I turned away from that car and we all took off running as fast as we go. I'm run we're all running. We get to, to the petty kid and say, like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. It was, it's one of those memories that's, that's really just stuck in my head as a core memory. Because it was, I think, a time it was like a moment where I think the enemy of all of our souls was just trying to get me off track. Just trying to get me to do something that I shouldn't do, be in a group I shouldn't be with, participating in things I shouldn't be participating in. And not, it's not like every moment is like that in, that in our lives, but there are just some moments that someone's acknowledging, hey, you're worth something, but they're not really worth your time. That they're acknowledging, hey, you're beautiful, but they're not really worth your time. They're acknowledging you're gifted, but they're really not worth your time. And so many of us are giving our best energy and our best time to people that we think deserve it, but really we ought not be giving it there because it ought to be giving someplace else to someone that's actually going to take it and cherish it and care for it and not stomp on it and beat it and disrespect it. But I also thought this, again, this is a commercial break, a little commercial break, that just because someone doesn't acknowledge your worth doesn't mean you're worthless. Like some of us right now have had someone in our lives disrespect or devalue us, and we're carrying that to this very day I uh I don't get it I was working on this sermon these random thoughts were coming maybe they were coming to my head uh teenage messages thoughts because our teenagers are going to youth camp uh this week which I'm super excited about we got youth camps to be praying for all of our teenagers and the leaders and and uh and I, I was thinking about this time I was in sixth grade okay and my mom had us in church me and my little sister in church every single Sunday okay every Sunday we were in church from seven years old till now. I'm, what, I'm 24 now. For, for all these years, <laughs> I've been in church every single Sunday. And, uh, but all my friends, they played football. And I wanted to play football. So I begged my mom. And kids, they know how to wear down a parent and I just I wore her down come on parents you know what I'm talking about it's like oh my god oh my gosh oh my gosh we, that's who we need to be interrogating people we just need to put like a, a three-year-old in there to ask why 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 they'll crack they'll crack immediately <laughs> I can't take it <laughs> this is where we see we hit the drugs here okay <laughs> So I wear down my mom. I'm like, Mom, come on, come on, let me play, let me play. So she lets me go try out for the Inglewood Eagles, all right? And we're there, and the, the tryout is happening, 
The coach says, everybody run around the, uh, the football field one time, and we're all running around the football field. Then the coach is standing uh, at the touchdown line, and he begins to, to separate all of us. He's like, okay, you go here. Okay, you go here. Okay, you there. You there. Okay, you here. You there. You here. You there. You, you, you. And he's separating all of us. And then he says, this group over here, you made the team. And this group over here, you didn't make the team. And I was in the group that didn't make the team. And I'm like, oh, man. So he says, if you didn't make the team, you can stay here for practice uh, if you'd like to, or, or you're free to go now. And I stayed. And I, I remember this. Still, I have a core memory. I, I'm, I'm at the practice. We're doing jumping jacks. And I'm crying. I'm like, I can't believe I, you know, I, I, I didn't make this team. And I go up to the coach afterwards. I don't know what gave me the boldness to do that. Probably, you know, my mom, she's so tough. So I, I go up to the coach afterwards. And I'm like, fool? No, I, I didn't say that. I was like, uh, I, said, I was like, you know, why, 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 why didn't I make the team? And he gave me some lame answer or something like that. Come to find out, he actually already had his team picked because uh, these kids had been playing for so long and I was a newbie and uh, I guess I, I, I wasn't good enough. So he, he gave me some answer. But every single game was on a Sunday. Every single game. And I look back on that now and even though he didn't pick me, I still feel like God kept me on the right path. Like, like I don't know exactly where I would be if for all those years, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, I wasn't in God's house. I felt like it was strategic for me to be in God's house week after week after week. And even though he rejected me, that coach, maybe you've heard this, man's rejection is sometimes God's protection. And I just feel like God was protecting me from getting my heart and my life wrapped in things I shouldn't. There's nothing wrong with sports, obviously. And if your kids play them, go all by all means. I'm just saying for my life, for that season, for that moment, I just think God was going, nope, go this way. He didn't acknowledge my worth, but it did not mean I was worth less. And if people in your life have not acknowledged your worth. It does not mean you're worthless. If people have been walking past you, disrespecting you, devaluing you, some of us, we have had so many different things happen in our life that we're looking at our piece of artwork and we're thinking, there is no way this is worth anything. You can go to Sephora and put on great makeup. You can go to the gym and have the best body, but you can still have a broken soul. And many of us, we've had people, whether it was a mom, a dad, a cousin, a coach, a friend, an ex, say something, do something. And it, it feels like it's diminished our value. We've depreciated in value. Sometimes it's not even just something somebody else does to us. Sometimes it's things we do to ourselves. We like we bring it on ourselves. I can't stand those decisions. Man, I can't stand when I'm my own worst enemy. I can't stand when I'm the one that makes the mistake. That, that damages the artwork that Jesus has made. But what I found about these sleeper hunters is the pieces of art they find usually aren't in pristine condition. Usually, they've been through something. Usually, there's some damage. Usually, there's a defect. Remember that guy Peter that we were talking about that Jesus picked in Matthew chapter 4? This same Peter, look at this in, in Matthew chapter 26. This same Peter is there with Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, verse number 34. And Jesus says these words to him, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, 
you will disown me three times. But Peter denied it. He, de he's, he declares, what? Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. We're not going anywhere, Jesus. We're with you. We have your back. We love you. You're our friend. You're the Messiah that we've been waiting for. I'll never disown you. And then you skip down to about verse number, I think it's 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, and 74. And you see, you can put it on the screen, that Jesus is being beaten because he's about to go to the cross. And a little girl walks up to Peter. Hey, aren't you with him? And Peter denies that he even knows Jesus. Skip down a couple more verses. Another little girl. Hey, aren't you with him? Peter denies that he even knows Jesus. Skip down a couple more verses. And people are like, hey, you are with him. Your accent gives you away. And Peter starts calling down curses on them. Your mama, your mama's mama, your mama's mama's mama. He gets so adamant that this, I do not know the man. Can you imagine the shame? Some of us know this shame because there are some moments we wish we would have spoken up and we didn't. We wish we would have said something and we didn't. We wish we would have called and we didn't. We wish we would have gone to the funeral, gone to the wedding, sent the text, apologized, and we didn't. And you're living in that disappointment and that shame. And it's real. Where have you at some point in time maybe lost some of your innocence? Went too far, didn't go far enough, tried the business and then it failed, with a friend, didn't work out, had the dream, but was never willing to take the step of faith, wanted to live too safe, looked at your life, thought, no, I can't do it. I've got too much to lose. And now you're in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. You're like, man, did I miss my moment? Peter here is in a spot, and he's like, man, I, I, think, I think I may have missed it. I'm damaged now. I've got some defects on my artwork. I guess I'll just be here stuck in the basement forever. So these sleeper hunters, though, like I told you, they, they, they find pieces of artwork that have, that have defects, that are damaged. And you know what they do? They bring it to a conservator, to an art restorer. They bring it to someone who can take that piece of art and bring it to life again. Uh, I'm, I'm not a sneaker head, okay? I, I'm not, I'm not at all. I, I have a pair of, I think, Dunks. Are they Dunk, dunk Lowe's? What, what are they, Parker? Yeah, okay, Parker just said they're Michigan Dunks, okay? So I didn't even know this, okay? So they're like yellow and blue, and I'm wearing them. People are like, ooh, I see you. And I'm like, okay, I don't even know. I don't care. Um, <laughs> but some of y'all sneaker heads, you love, 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 love sneakers, okay? So, uh, and this is, this is big business right now, too, sneakers. Uh, do you know that a pair of Jordan Chicago's ones, like Jordan ones, like Chicago, like from 1994, 1995, they cost like $5,000. Four pair of shoes, $5,000. So I, I looked up, uh, look, look at this video here. Uh, sh show, them, show them the video, Make, do the big screen. Uh, look at these. These are a pair of retro Jordan 1s, like from 19, like I said, 94, 95. They are beat down, destroyed. No one's paying $5,000 for those. Nobody. But you can take this shoe and bring it to a restorer. And the restorer can take this shoe right here 
and turn it into something totally different. Show, show them my next video. They can take that shoe and turn it into that. It looks brand new. It's been repainted. It has been cleaned. It's been scrubbed. And now someone would buy that shoe for four or five thousand dollars. See, this is one of the best problems with the grace of God. If I even dare call anything a problem with God's grace. It is, he cleans us up so well that people look at us and they think we've never been through anything. This happens all the time at church. People walk in, they're like, I can't go here. I can't be a part of this place. These people are perfect. If you knew... Who I was two years ago, five years ago, shoot, five weeks ago. If you knew what I looked like, I was worse than a busted up pair of Jordans. And the grace of God got a hold of my life and began to wash me and scrub me and take away my sin and my shame and turn me into the man or the woman that you see before you right now. I did not always look like this. I've been through dirt. I've been through mud. I've been through pain. I've been through divorce. I've been through loss. This smile is not fake. This smile is the grace of God. I'm thankful that I'm even standing here today. If it had not been for the grace of God, I don't know where I'd be. Here, here, even at church or online or in additional seating, just need to know we're not perfect. Church people aren't perfect. We are perfectly forgiven, but we're not perfect. So now that us non-perfect people <laughs> have been perfectly forgiven by our wonderful Savior. We have been called and touched by the ultimate sleeper hunter, Jesus. Now, we too become sleeper hunters. See, it's one thing to go, yes, I'm a valuable piece of art. That's beautiful. But it does not stop with you. Now you and I, we walk through neighborhoods and our schools and with our friends and on basketball courts and in boardrooms and we look at people and we just remind them, I know a great piece of art when I see it and there is something about you that's not just about this world. It's otherworldly. Because you were made by God. This is why we have hosts standing at doors. This is why we have people watching your kids. This is why we have our connect groups. This is why we do the things we do. We're trying to remind people of the beautiful piece of art that they are. And now since you are this piece of art, understand that you have the mandate, the call, the honor, dare I say the responsibility to bring this hope and life everywhere you go. And in Luke chapter 5, you can put it on the screen uh, real quick. Jesus walks up to a guy who's a tax collector. People don't like him. They can't stand him because he is overtaxing his people and probably taking a lot of the money off of the top and putting it in his own pocket. They can't stand him. But Jesus picks the person that other people can't stand. And if you go on to the next verse, this Matthew, this Levi who was called, throws a party. And at the party, look who's there. It's a whole bunch of other tax collectors. A whole other, a bunch of other misfits. A bunch of other people that know what it's like to be marginalized. To be talked about. To be on the out. And that's who Levi, Matthew, brings with him to the party. He says, this sleeper hunter Jesus picked me, but it's not just staying with me. 
I've got to bring all of my tax collector friends with me because I pick you just like he picked me. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10 says, we are God's workmanship. We are God's piece of art created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance for us to do. You are that artwork. I don't want to leave Peter in this spot where he failed because he was picked and then he denies Jesus. But then in Acts chapter 2, verse number 14, that same Peter stands up and he starts to preach. Acts 2, 14, he stands up amongst the 11 and he begins to preach this message. And he's like, these people aren't drunk. It's only 9 in the morning. If it was 10, maybe, but it's 9 in the morning. They're not drunk. This is what was spoken about a long time ago. And you skip all the way to verse number 41. On this sermon that that Peter preaches, 3,000 people give their hearts and their lives to Jesus Christ in one day. Jesus picked Peter knowing Peter would fail, but he also knew the purpose that he'd put in Peter's life. And I want you to know that's the same for you. This uh, phrase, sleeper hunter, uh, it's actually from a documentary. I, I saw it on uh, the airplane and I, I, I like documentaries, so I, I, I started watching it. And you don't, you don't have to watch it at all, but it's a documentary called The Lost Leonardo. And this picture, uh, this painting, is what was seen in, uh, put it on the screen for me. This is what was seen in some random art gallery. And the sleeper hunter saw it, and he thought, hmm, there's something about this. Come to find out, enough people believe that this piece of art was made by who art enthusiasts would call the master, Da Vinci, the one who made the Mona Lisa. He purchased this piece of art for $1,175. Later, this piece of art sold for $450 million. The sleeper hunter found it, damaged, purchased it, brought it to the restorer, and then the rest of the world saw what it was really worth. I just need you to know you might be damaged, you might feel like you have some defects. We've been purchased by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he is saying you're actually worth more than $450 million. You're worth my very life is what Jesus says. Now go and do the same. Because Jesus is saying to all of us, every lost Leonardo under the sound of my voice, I know a great piece of art when I see it. Because I made you. If you wouldn't mind, bow your heads for just a moment. Every man and woman under the sound of my voice. I want you to bow your heads just so you can focus for a second. If you're under the sound of my voice, and you're honest with yourself, you would say, right now, I'm not a follower of Jesus. Yeah, I, I, I believe in God, maybe, but, but, but I'm, I'm not a follower of Jesus. Like, I have not given... The, the authority of my life, the, the driver's seat, the keys to the car of my life, I have not given those over to God. I'm in the driver's seat. I'm doing my own thing, going my own direction. You under the sound of my voice today, you're saying you, you can sense the grace of God, saying, son, daughter, it's time to turn. The Bible used the word repent. It just means to turn. It just means to go another direction. And it's the ultimate sleeper hunter that's knocking on the door of your heart right now saying, hey, friend, 
I made you in the first place. Give your heart and your life over to me. I'm not asking were you confirmed as a child. I'm not asking do you have a Bible. I'm not asking do you believe in God. I'm asking do you want to give the authority? Ready to respond to God's grace and say, God, you can have the authority to be in charge of my life. If that's you, you've never given your heart to Christ, or at one point in time you did, you slipped away. On the count of three, I just want you to throw your hand in the air and say, yep, that's me. I want to give my heart and my life to Christ. Ready? One, two, three. Just throw your hand in the air. You're saying, yep, that's me. We've got friends all over this room, online. Come on, in the, in the uh, additional seating, you're raising your hand. You're saying, yep, I don't want to go my own way. I want to go his way. I don't want to be first. I want Jesus to be first in my life. I want to get off of my path, get on his path. I'm going to ask everyone to do me a favor. Put your hand over your heart right now. I'm going to ask everyone to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say, dear Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. I admit I've made mistakes. And today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Give me the power to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we lift our heads up? Come on, clap our hands with enthusiasm.